Installing an operating system is very similar to solving the problem of the chicken and the egg. If you don't have an operating system on the computer, how are you supposed to install an operating system? We commonly solve this problem by booting our system to an installation program that is usually running in a bare bones version of an operating system. One common method is to use a bootable USB drive. We've used specialized software to make this USB drive bootable, and we're using it on a motherboard that is able to support booting from a USB flash drive. We would then put all of the installation programs for the operating system on this flash drive, install the flash drive into a system, and start the computer. But you may be in an environment where you're either not able to use those USB interfaces, or it may be tedious to physically visit every single computer just to install an operating system. In that case, we might want to boot the computer across the network. This is a network boot that's commonly referred to as PIXI or PXE. This stands for Pre-Boot Execution Environment. The BIOS of the computer has to be able to support this PIXI boot functionality. And when you start your computer, that PIXI boot function will look across your local network to try to find a PIXI boot server. Once it finds that PIXI server, it can boot that operating system installation program as if it was a drive locally connected to the computer. And of course, you could use internal or external solid state drives or hard drives to install these operating system files and make those drives bootable so that you can start the operating system installation program when you start your computer. Some systems can also boot and install the operating system across the internet. A good example of this is a number of Linux distributions that are designed with a minimal download to get things started, and then it downloads any other code it might need from the internet. Mac OS has a recovery installation built into the BIOS of Mac OS that will go out to the internet and download versions of Mac OS to install. And Windows Updates also provides a way to install operating systems directly from an internet source. Older operating systems used to distribute their code on optical disks, things like CD-ROMs and DVD-ROMs. There's a standard format for taking an optical disk and taking everything on that disk and creating a disk image file known as an ISO image. This ISO image contains everything that would normally be found on that optical disk. So we can configure and set up an entire OS installation on one single ISO image and simply boot from that image. This is a very common format to boot from if you're using virtualization software, and there are some external drives that will mount that ISO image and make the image appear as if it is a physical disk. And since this is on an external drive, you can disconnect it from one computer, take it to another computer, and perform another installation. The same installation files you have on the external or hot swappable drive could also be copied to an internal drive that's in your computer. This means all of the installation files would be available on a local partition that's on your computer, and you simply boot from that partition and install your operating system into a separate partition on that system. And it's not unusual for many folks to install multiple operating system types on the same computer. You could have Windows and Linux on the same physical device, for example, and then decide which one to start during the boot up process. This is often referred to as a multi-boot system. Once you start the installation process, you also have a number of options on how you would like to install those files onto this system. One very common approach is to perform a clean install. This means we're going to wipe everything in that partition and we're going to completely reinstall the operating system. When you're done with a clean install, none of the previous files that were on that system will remain because you are deleting everything and starting over from scratch. If you already have a working operating system on this computer and you'd simply like to install a newer version of the operating system and keep all of your applications and all of your data in place, then you'll want to perform an in-place upgrade. This means you can update your operating system, but you don't have to install any new applications and you don't have to recover any of your data files from backup. In many organizations, this process is streamlined by creating an image deployment. This means you would install an operating system on a computer and then add the applications and the configurations necessary to run in your environment. Once you have this exactly the way you would like it, you can create an image of that system and simply install the image on all of the other computers. You can also completely automate this process so from the very beginning to the very end of the re-imaging process is something that doesn't require any type of human intervention. 
If you don't want to carry around an external hard drive or a bootable USB drive to perform these installations, you can put all of your install files on a separate network drive. Then you can begin a remote network installation from that local server or that local shared drive so that you don't have to have any local media next to the computer. Most modern operating systems will also install a recovery partition. This is commonly installed as a hidden partition, so your end user isn't commonly going to see this partition, but all of the installation files for the operating system are contained in that recovery partition. So if you're doing any type of detailed troubleshooting on a computer, but you didn't bring any of the operating system installation files, you'll probably be able to find all of them in the recovery partition. Windows also has a way to reinstall the operating system by simply copying over everything that's already there, but leaving the base configuration in place. This is referred to as a repair installation, and it's commonly done to fix any major problems with the operating system that can't be solved any other way. This will overwrite all of your operating system files, but it will leave all of your user files and documents in place. And in some cases, the drivers that are on your installation program may not recognize all of the hardware on your computer. In that case, you may have to load third-party drivers to connect to a storage device or to a network connection. You will usually have a prompt during the installation process itself that will ask you if you'd like to install any of these third-party drivers, and then you have the opportunity to install them and use that hardware during the installation of the program. You'll usually get a prompt during the installation process itself for installing these third-party drivers, and once you install the drivers, you'll now have access to the storage drive, the network, or any other hardware that's necessary to install this operating system. One of the challenges we're often faced with in an organization is that we may have users all over the world, they have many different systems that they might be using, and we need to have some way that they can perform this operating installation, but still be able to have all of the configuration settings necessary to use it on the corporate network. Generally, we would perform a zero-touch deployment to make this happen. This is an automated installation process that walks the user through the installation with little or no prompts that they would have to answer. This would also include configuration settings that are company specific, such as email server settings. This means the user can open their new laptop, turn it on, and then wait for the installation process to complete. And during that install, there will be an automated script that will configure the system, set up the domain connections, configure the email settings, and perform any other type of configurations necessary for your organization. Once you've built and optimized one of these zero-touch deployments, you can re-image a laptop, ship it to anywhere in the world to any user in your organization, and they'll be able to turn it on and immediately be productive. Before we can install an operating system, we need to create a logical section of your storage drive that will be designated as a place to keep data. This is referred to as a disk partition. Some operating systems prefer having multiple partitions on a drive. Others may use one single large partition. And often you may want to set up separate partitions just to keep data separated on that storage device. We've already discussed one type of partition as a recovery partition, and that's something that the operating system commonly creates during the installation process itself. So once you're done and you reboot the system, you may see the operating system as one large partition, but if you were to look closely at that particular drive configuration, you would see an additional hidden partition for recovery. You might also want to create separate partitions if you have multiple operating systems that you're installing. For example, you might take part of the drive and dedicate it to a Windows configuration and set up a partition just for Windows, and then create a separate partition that you would use for a Linux installation. Once you create this partition and format the partition with a particular file system, Microsoft refers to these as volumes. If you see this term being used in your Windows documentation, just remember that a volume is simply a formatted partition. When you format a partition, you'll be asked to format it with one of two different styles. One of these styles is a GPT partition style. This stands for a GUID partition table. That GUID is an abbreviation for Globally Unique Identifier. And if you're installing one of the more recent operating systems, you're probably configuring the partition as a GPT partition. To be able to use this GUID partition table style, you will need a BIOS that is a UEFI BIOS, and this means that you can configure up to 128 partitions using this GPT partition style. 
If you have a storage drive big enough, the GPT partition style will support a total drive size of over 9 billion terabytes. Microsoft Windows, though, has a limitation on the total size of a GPT partition that is currently set to 256 terabytes. If you're familiar with the MBR partition style, which we'll talk about in just a moment, you'll know that that style uses a method of partitioning known as extended partitions and logical drives. Other partition styles may require that you configure the type of partition. Fortunately, the GPT partition style simply creates one of 128 partitions on the drive, which makes it a much simpler form of partitioning. Before there was the GPT partition style and before we had a UEFI BIOS, we were using the MBR partition style or master boot record. And you will still find MBR partition styles still in place and certainly you'll find them on legacy devices. One of the reasons that we no longer use the MBR style is that the maximum partition size that you can use with an MBR partition is two terabytes. As you recall, with the GPT partition style, you could have 128 partitions on a storage drive, and each of those partitions was effectively the same type of partition. With the MBR partition style, you have two types of partitions. There's a primary partition and an extended partition. On an MBR drive, a primary partition is the only type of partition that is bootable. This means if you're installing Windows, Linux, or some other operating system on your computer, and you're using the MBR partition style, you'll need to install that operating system into one of those bootable partitions. Keep in mind also that you have a limited number of primary partitions you can use. MBR only supports four primary partitions per storage drive. This means if you've installed four separate bootable operating systems into four of those primary partitions, you've now maxed out the primary partitions on your MBR drive. Also keep in mind that only one of those partitions can be marked as the active bootable partition on that drive. If you want to automatically boot from a different partition, you'll need to change that in the partitioning software of your computer. But what if you wanted more than four partitions on a single storage drive? You can do that by installing one extended partition on each storage device. An extended partition is not required, but it is something you can install if you need additional partitions on that drive. Inside of that extended partition, you can then create multiple logical partitions. Keep in mind, however, that these logical partitions are not bootable, so if you need a bootable partition, you would need to configure one as a primary partition. This partitioning process is usually one of the very first things you have to do when you're installing an operating system. Sometimes there are existing partitions on a drive and you might need to remove them, or you may be able to add additional partitions along with them. This is the dialog box you have inside of Windows when you want to format a drive, and it's very similar to the dialog you get during an operating system installation. You can see that you can select which drive you would like to use, and then you would decide whether you would use MBR for master boot record or GPT for the GUID partition table. Remember again that your MBR style disk can only have up to four primary partitions. And if you're using a GUID partition table, you can have up to 128. This of course requires you to have a UEFI BIOS or work in a BIOS compatibility mode, which was a common mode when we were transitioning from our older style BIOS to the newer UEFI BIOS. If you enable the BIOS compatibility mode, it disables the ability to secure boot which means that many of your newer operating systems will not work in a BIOS compatibility mode. This process of creating a partition or removing a partition can very easily delete your data. You have to know exactly what partition you would like to remove and what is on that particular partition. So if you're doing any type of drive administration on your local computer, make sure you're very careful not to repartition or change your existing partitions because you could very easily lose data. This is the installation screen you get at the very beginning of the Windows installation so that you can partition an area for Windows to be installed. The installation for this computer has found a 60 gig drive and it's showing that there is nothing allocated in that 60 gig. This means that there are no existing partitions that we might need to delete or work around. And you'll notice that we have options here to add new partitions. We can install additional device drivers from this screen. So if we have a separate drive controller that we've installed, we can install the device driver directly from the screen. 
And of course, we can select that drive and then decide how big of a partition we might need for the Windows installation. Once we've created a partition that we would use to install the operating system, we first need to format that partition to be able to store data in it. And there are two ways to do this in Windows. There's the quick format and there's the full format. The quick format, as the name implies, is a very quick way to perform a format because all it's really doing is creating a file table on that partition. It's not performing any physical checks of the storage drive either, so you would want to feel comfortable that that drive was safe to store data on. This quick format is effectively erasing the file system table as if no data was ever installed on that particular drive. From a security perspective, this technically means that we could recover some of that old data with the right software. So if you want a secure installation, a quick format may not be the best choice. If you're installing Windows 10 or Windows 11, quick format is the default setting during that installation. If you wanted to perform a full format, you could change that in the disk part utility. A full format is a much more intensive formatting process. It's going to write zeros across the entire disk, which means it effectively erases anything that was there previously. One of the drawbacks to this, of course, is that it has to go through the entire drive to write this information, and that can be time consuming. So if you need this installation to be done very quickly, you might want to choose quick format, but if this is something that needs to be much more secure, a full format might be your better option.